So I'll. So it's a pleasure to have Yang Li, who will be speaking about the metric SYZ conjecture. Hello. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the metric SYZ conjecture. Um, so this is a very different style of thinking compared to the talks we have heard so far. Uh, so I should say my background is more in the kind of Kähler geometry or differential geometry general vein, uh, rather than the very categorical or symplectic or algebraic uh, perspective. So I generally view these two approaches as mutually complementary rather than kind of competing or anything. Um, so the, the metric understanding of the SYZ conjecture is probably closer to SYZ's original proposal. Uh, somehow the field went in a very different direction, uh, maybe since 2000 or something. Uh, so maybe I would, the first half of the talk is basically give you a flavor about how differential geometers generally understand the problem. Um, so the main difference between differential geometry and the, the kind of symplectic or algebraic perspective is that uh, differential geometry is more about uh, the actual PDE. Um, so the algebraic geometers or symplectic geometers generally only focus on either, let's say, the complex geometry or the symplectic geometry, and usually not both at the same time. Uh, I mean, if they do appear the, at the same time, they would be on the mirror side. They, they won't be on the same side. So trying to describe, uh, so as a kind of general philosophy, trying to describe a um, complex manifold uh, really amounts to a finite amount of data because typically speaking, the deformation of complex manifolds, um, the kind of projective varieties, amounts to basically deforming the coefficients of the defining polynomials. And that's a finite amount of information. So it's the same with symplectic geometry uh, for which the kind of, to describe a symplectic manifold amounts to a finite number of parameters. Let's say, for example, it's essentially the um, second cohomology class, the symplectic form lies in. However, to describe the actual metric requires an infinite amount of data, uh, and it involves solutions to PDEs, which is a very different way of looking at uh, the problem compared to the other approaches. So for a differential geometer, the SYZ conjecture has several possible meanings, but today I'm going to focus on a weak formulation of it. Uh, which is to prove that for a suitable class of clavier manifolds near the so-called large complex structure limit, uh, that a special Lagrangian torus vibration of half of the real dimensions exists in the generic region. So I hope everybody knows what clavier means. Um, this includes um, the data of uh, a holomorphic uh, volume form and which in particular specifies a complex structure uh, and it involves a symplectic form. Uh, and these two are meant to be compatible in the sense that this, these give a, a Kähler metric. And the Calabial condition is saying that um, the volume form defined from this Kähler metric agrees up to scale, which you can normalize to, to be one or something, uh, with a canonical volume form defined by your holomorphic volume form. So if you're given a holomorphic volume form, then you can uh, canonically construct a volume form by basically taping, taking uh, this omega wedge omega bar. Um, so this means there is a canonical measure on this manifold. Uh, and Yao's famous theorem tells you that there exists a unique uh, Calabial metric, so-called Calabial metric, uh, within this given cohomology class. So for differential geometers, the kind of holy grail in this particular area is to understand the behavior of the Calabial metric. So you might say we already know from Yao theorem that this metric exists, so, so what else is left to do? So the typical question is to say, well, we know uh, from Yao theorem that this metric depends on two pieces of data, uh, this cohomology class specifying the Kähler class uh, and the complex structure. So both are a finite amount of information, but to actually describe the metric is an infinite amount of information. 
So what you need to do is to sort of understand how the metric actually depends on the parameter. So somehow the dependence is really what we are trying to focus on. Uh, and typically the question is really formulated in terms of certain limits, which is to say, uh, you can imagine you vary these uh, parameters like uh, either the symplectic form or the complex structure in such a way that you, you push this in, in a certain extreme and you look at what the metric is doing under that limit. So there are lots of um, kind of quite non-algebraic uh, phenomena you could uh, see with um, this kind of degenerations. So for instance, for instance the simplest kind of behavior you could see is, uh, for example, you take an elliptic curve. Uh, so imagine the elliptic curve becomes nodal. So in this kind of um, picture, uh, the easiest picture you can think in your mind is that an elliptic curve is described in terms of its fundamental domain by some parallelogram or in the simplest case, a rectangle. Uh, so one easy thing you could do is to simply stretch the rectangle in, in a way that maybe fix the length or and, and then stretch the width. Um, so you can see that in a limit, um, somehow if you, uh, let's say, suppose you renormalize everything so that the area is fixed, then what you see is that this kind of complex manifolds can become a real manifold or something like a line in a limit. So which means um, thinking about metric limits might actually ask you to go beyond the algebraic world. Uh, so this is only the tip of an iceberg. So according to the XYZ conjecture, um, it, so for differential geometers, it's really about trying to understand how the metric becomes um, under a particular kind of limit called large complex structure limit, uh, which I'm going to explain later. So the SYZ is physically motivated and it has many possible interpretations. Um, so I guess you are already familiar with many other interpretations like homological mirror symmetry, et cetera. Um, so in terms of this differential geometric picture, the strong version of the SYZ conjecture is to say that the special Lagrangian vibration exists globally. Um, so this is in contrast to the weak SYZ conjecture I'm proposing to talk about today, uh, which only asks you know, about the existence question in the generic region. And what do I mean by generic? So I just told you that there is a canonical measure uh, on this manifold which you can of course normalize to total volume one uh, and you can regard this as a probability measure. And then uh, you could ask basically, instead of having this special Lagrangian vibration globally, you can ask um, for some kind of Lagrangian tor uh, torus vibration um, on a set with basically 99.99% of the manifold. So this actually changes the nature of the question quite drastically uh, because the strong version um, basically has to deal with the most singular, ver uh, singular regions of the manifold as well as the smooth regions. Um, the generic version somehow is only talking about the smooth regions. So somehow the nature of these two questions uh, are quite different. Uh, uh, Yang, there's a question from Umut. Uh, they speak out. Oh, sorry. This is an introductory. Can I ask from a differential geometry viewpoint, how strong is this physical motivation? Like for, for you, when you think about this physical motivation, does it make you believe that this is correct or is it just some kind of approximate uh, leading, guiding thing? So my personal opinion is that for Calabial threefolds, I would believe in a strong version. For, for higher dimensions, I would probably not. And this is somehow physically, like what is this physical motivation? I feel like this somehow completely got lost for me. There is supposed to be some physical motivation, but I can't understand anymore how strong this motivation is. And uh, in, my, in my opinion, the physical motivation is not strong enough to 
Well, so first of all, I don't understand the physical motivation very well myself. Uh, and as far as I can tell, uh, the physical, the original SYZ um, paper does not really have very strong evidence in the singular region. So I would say that the strongest, uh, well, the strongest, so the strongest evidence uh, I will actually mention is the semi-flat picture, uh, which only deals with the generic region. So as far as I can see in a singular region, or the, the kind of the region with large curvature, the existence of um, the special Lagrangian vibration is highly tentative as far as I can see. Okay, thank you. This, was what I... so this is a skeptic answer, but no, it's, it's what I imagine. It's just I can weird. also tell you that uh, there's previous work by Dominic Joyce, which suggests that this is, well, at least a naive interpretation is wrong. Uh, yes. So for instance, the special Lagrangian vibration almost has no chance to be defined by a globally smooth map. So this is in contrast to holomorphic vibrations where you can have singular fibers, but the map is still going to be smooth. So in, in the special Lagrangian world, this is almost certainly false. Okay, thank you. So the large complex structure limit um, means the following. So first of all, you're considering polarized degenerations. The word polarized, I guess one possible way to, to kind of think of it is to fix the symplectic structure. Uh, more technically, it means there is a line bundle over the total space of the family. Uh, which gives you basically, which specifies the first chain class and therefore gives you the symplectic class. Um, so the degeneration is basically a family of clavial manifolds over a punctured algebraic curve uh, whose so-called essential skeleton has dimension n. Uh, so the essential skeleton is a birational invariant you can attach to any algebraic degenerations uh, and we will actually talk about that more later. Um, so the essential skeleton is a kind of simplicial object and it, its dimension is at most n. And um, the large complex structure is basically saying the essential skeleton has exactly this maximal possible dimension. And therefore sometimes people also call this kind of degeneration the maximal degenerations. So there are some small variations about what people prefer to call uh, large complex structure limit. So for example, some people ask that uh, the family has a semi-stable simple normal crossing model, um, which basically just means you can present the family in a, in a particularly nice way. The, the word semi-stable means that all the components of uh, the SNC model has multiplicity one. So the essential skeleton is actually something you can discover um, by trying to compute the clavial volume integrals. So as long as you give me the holomorphic volume form, you can associate the volume form. And you can certainly try to think about what is the behavior of, the, of this volume form as uh, you change the complex structure. So before you start to understand anything about the metric, this is the more accessible question. And if you think hard enough about this question, you will actually discover the essential skeleton yourself. And we will later describe uh, this calculation. Um, but for, for the purpose of uh, people who don't know about this concept, you should think this is a kind of simplicial object you can um, canonically attach to a degeneration family uh, in a way that, uh, that is not sensitive to making birational modifications to the family. So by, by this, I mean, uh, you should think that you, you are given this family over the punctured algebraic curve. Um, so when you write this family, uh, by completing the family into uh, something actually defined over the, the field algebraic curve, uh, you can always try to make Birational modifications to the central fiber. So, for example, you can always blow up the central fiber further. So, obviously, this gives you a highly non canonical choice of the way to write down uh, this family. And this is what we mean by the model. Um, however, we want some kind of 
objects which captures uh, the degeneration uh, in a way which is not sensitive to this kind of, um, in some way, non-canonical choice. And, and there is a good concept which is called the essential skeleton. As I said, the word generic means you only care about 99.99% of the manifold, not the entire manifold. Um, so I guess uh, some background about um, previous work. So the SYZ conjecture is closely related to um, the work of Gross and Wilson about the K3 surface case. So this is a situation which has been uh, almost completely described, um, which involves a K3 surface with an elliptic vibration, by which I mean uh, a holomorphic vibration where the fibers are uh, elliptic curves. So the situation in that context is that you actually fix a complex structure and you modify the you, you vary the Kähler class in such a way that uh, the elliptic curve fibers have very small volume in a limit. So you basically try to collapse down the manifold to the base of the vibration. So this situation is uh, morally very similar to uh, the SYZ situation we are talking about, uh, but it's a slightly different situation, but it's still a very good guideline. Uh, some, some, some other previous uh, work coming from a different direction is the work of uh, Sebastian Buxong and his collaborators about the so-called non-comedian geometry. Um, so for the first half of the elementary talk, we won't actually go much into the details. Um, but let me just tell you what was the flavor of the subject. So the non-comedian pluripotential theory has very strong analogy with Kähler geometry. So in particular, there is a notion of plurisubharmonic functions, uh, which is basically a kind of a version of Kähler metrics. Uh, and you can associate Monchampe measures, which is basically the Clavier volume, the, basically the volume measure you can associate to Kähler metrics. Uh, and there's a version of Yao theorem in that context. Um, so without necessarily going into the technical foundations, uh, let me just tell you that uh, this package uh, is built on very different foundations, but it has very similar properties compared to typical Kähler geometry. Um, so in particular, um, this non-comedian version of the Clavier theorem is a priori speaking not even a PDE. So what I want to emphasize is that this whole package, uh, a priori speaking, does not involve differential geometric concepts, but it, it's behaving very much like differential geometric concepts. So the, let me just mention the main goal of this talk, which is to tell you about the main theorem. Uh, the theorem is to say um, this weak SYZ conjecture actually will follow from some other conjecture in this non-comedian geometry. So what I want to emphasize with, without explaining all the details, uh, so at the moment you just have to impressionistically think that um, the SYZ conjecture is all about the PDE, at least for differential geometers. So the concept of a cloud geometric or the concept of special Lagrangians. These are PD related concepts. Um, however, the non comedian side, a priori, is defined in terms of totally different foundations, like intersection theory, etc. Uh, it has very similar formal properties, but it's built on totally different machinery. Um, so, without actually telling you what the non-comedian conjecture is, with which I will go to the more formal talk. Um, I just want to emphasize that this condition is purely algebraic. The difficulty of um, this theorem at the moment is that because the non-comedian approach is not sufficiently uh, well investigated, 
at the moment on concrete examples, it's quite hard to verify um, these conjectural statements. So let me maybe go to explain the easy bits of uh, the backgrounds. So to tell you some basic features of the complex geometry about large complex structure limit. So if you need to know one thing about large complex structure limit, I would say it's that the generic region, at least in a measure theoretic sense, is locally modeled on C star to the N. Well, so how do you arrive at such a conclusion? Um, so there's a natural problem I just mentioned you could think of before you think anything about the metric, which is you want to first understand the volume form. And this is much easier than understanding the metric because uh, the holomorphic volume form is what you can regard as a priority given data. The metric is something you get after solving some PDE. So if you just ask about the volume form, uh, it doesn't require you to solve any PD, and therefore it's the easy part. So let's try to compute the Calabria volume for, for um, let's say, a large complex structure degeneration. So what you're given is a semi-stable simple normal crossing model, uh, which is basically a way of writing this degeneration family. So simple normal crossing means basically uh, the vibration map locally looks like this. Um, and in, in, in particular, um, when I say semi-stable, I mean the multiplicities of these devices are exactly one. So instead of having maybe ZI to some power, I would just have power one, which is uh, another simplification. So you are given some holomorphic volume form on the total space, which can only vanish somewhere on the central fiber because you assume the other fibers are Calabi Yau. So once you are given a holomorphic volume form on the total space, you can write the holomorphic volume forms on the fibers uh, by this simple formula, which is sometimes called the adjunction formula. So now you have this local description of the holomorphic vibration map giving you this family of Calabial manifolds. So this, this would be the local picture around uh, some point uh, on the central fiber where let's say K plus one devices on the central fibers intersect. And this K is of course smaller or equal to N because uh, well, you, your devices are assumed to be transversely intersecting, uh, and therefore, of course, n plus two devices would not have any kind of intersection because the total space would have dimension n plus one. So these set eyes are local defining functions of the components of the central fibers. So the, the central fiber would be basically a, a union of uh, transversely intersecting devices of the total space. And you can locally write everything in this very simple manner. Well, then what you can do is that you can compute what this omega t is explicitly. Uh, once you have some kind of expression for this holomorphic volume form on a total space. So you can write the holomorphic volume form in this manner with some kind of coefficients ai specifying basically the vanishing order of uh, the holomorphic volume form. So we are secretly taking a normalization that uh, the minimum of the AI uh, among all the AIs you can see is zero. So this is just a, a normalization convention, which you can do by kind of multiplying the holomorphic volume form by a global meromorphic function. You can always write everything in this form. Well, according to our formula, expressing the fiber-wise Calabria vol holomorphic volume form in terms of the global volume form, once you get an expression of the global holomorphic volume form, you can compute the fiber-wise holomorphic volume form. And what you get is this expression. 
So here, the, the log factors comes from the fact that uh, because we have the, the local holomorphic map is modeled on this. Um, so when you do this computation, when you divide by dt, you will actually divide out by something like z1 onto zk. So this gives rise to these log factors instead of, um, so for, for those other factors which are not affected by um, this kind of local holomorphic vibration singularities, uh, these will not have the log factors. Now, once you get the holomorphic volume form, you can uh, compute the volume form, which is basically this up to a scale. And then an exercise in um, integrals in polar coordinates uh, will give you um, the kind of asymptotic behavior of this as t goes to zero, which is to say when the family of clavial manifolds um, converge to the central fiber. So you can easily see that the dominant contribution will come from the situation where those uh, exponents a, a0 onto ak were actually zero. So this is related to the fact that uh, only in this case uh, does this kind of log factors give rise to um, kind of logarithmic factors in the volume interval. Otherwise, it would be just some kind of O1. So this suggests that the case where all the AIs are equal to zero uh, is where the volume truly comes from. The large complex structure limit is saying that the maximum number K appearing here is exactly N, which is an equivalent way of saying what the large complex structure limit is. So in this particular case, you can see that the generic region is just modeled on this local um, expression. Um, so the situation in the total space is that you have n plus one transversely intersecting devices and your vibration map is given very simply in terms of this. And your holomorphic volume form is simply the products of, uh, of these d log zi, zi factors. So if you think carefully about what uh, this simple formula means, so your total space locally, you should think is the neighborhood of some point where those n plus one devices intersect. Um, so this T specifies which fiber you are on. Uh, these ZIs are coordinates on the total space. If you think about what this equation defines, you, you, you immediately realize you get something like C star to the N. And the holomorphic volume form is exactly the one compat compatible with that, at, at least asymptotically, as t goes to zero. So this tells you that the generic region is precisely C star to the N. Um, yeah, uh, may I ask a question? Okay. Uh, so when you say generic, uh, what do you mean? Because here it's just a, a, a small open subset, uh, right? It's not really generic. So, so this is precisely one of the main points. So doing this volume computation tells you uh, an important message, which is that what you see algebraically as small is from the measure theoretic viewpoint large. Uh, so the neighborhood of this one point where those n plus one devices intersect is contributing to the total volume uh, by an order of uh, log t to the to the nth power. Uh, so, on the on the kind of other extreme, uh, if you are just on a, a single divisor uh, without any intersection. Then that country, so that looks big from the algebraic perspective, or that that's actually the biggest from the algebraic perspective, but its volume contribution is just O1. So, so when this T is going to zero, this is actually the region which dominates the measure. So from the measure theoretic viewpoint, what appears generic is precisely the opposite of what you think should be generic from the algebraic perspective. So this also contributes to another effect, which is um, 
when you consider this kind of degeneration, the, the limit is not expected to be an algebraic object. In, instead, it, it had better be a very transcendental object. So the typical example being the elliptic curve degeneration I mentioned earlier. Okay. So if you reflect slightly more on uh, this picture or this computation, you will come up with some other concepts. So one thing you notice is that this computation depends quite strongly on um, the intersection patterns of the various devices, which controls the local expression of the vibration map. So for example, T equal to zero uh, multiplied by Z1 essential onto ZK means uh, basically you have K plus one devices intersecting. So you want to encode the intersection pattern of the devices in a succinct way. So there's a certain amount of combinatorics, obviously, built into this uh, description. And it's precisely the data of a dual complex. So we are given this simple normal crossing model, uh, and we attach a symplectual complex uh, as follows. So for every component of the central fiber, which is a, a divisor, EI, you attach a vertex. And when you see uh, some of these devices intersecting, of course, transversely because of uh, the SNC assumption, uh, you attach a simplex whose vertices are those VIs. So in this way, you get some kind of simplicial complex. And this is a, a combinatorial description of the degeneration. So you should think that the previous measure theoretic computation is telling you that this kind of dual intersection complex uh, is in, in some sense a better approximation to this central fiber, which is the kind of more algebraic way of thinking about the degeneration. Now, because the metric is more strongly attached to the measure than than the algebraic structure in, in a way. Uh, so you should think this should be more relevant for, for the metric when you consider the limiting behavior. Now, another message uh, from the previous computation is that uh, the special situation where all the AIs are equal to zero, which we stipulate to be the minimum of all the AIs, uh, that must be something quite special because that, that's where the, vo the major volume contribution comes from. Uh, so this defines you a subcomplex, because basically for each EI, you uh, attach uh, this coefficient AI, uh, and saying that this is equal to zero would, would single out a, a particular subcollection of the devices, uh, and in particular, a subcomplex of the above simplicial complex. The advantage of doing this is that although the SNC model itself is highly non-unique, because once you get an SNC model, you can always blow up further many times, um, the essential skeleton itself, uh, although a priori extracted from the, a very non-unique thing, is actually independent of how you blow up. So the essential skeleton is a variational invariant. We denote this as SKX in a self-explanatory way. This should not be too surprising to you by our previous computation of the volume, because um, previously we were thinking about the asymptotes of the volume form. And this really is independent of what you do on the central fiber. So making variational modifications to the central fiber should not change anything to do with the answers uh, of how to describe the volume form. So since the essential skeleton is what you should regard as where the volume measure truly lies on the limit, um, so the Calabial volume measure should not care about the, this variational transform, and therefore the essential skeleton should also be variationally uh, invariant. So maybe to get you into the mindset further, there is also a hybrid topology uh, in which you, um, you start from your original family, but you remove the central fiber and you replace the central fiber by uh, this dual complex. 
Uh, and in fact, you can put some kind of topology on uh, this hybrid thing you get, which is neither simplicial nor algebraic, but rather describes how algebraic things can somehow degenerate into simplicial things. Uh, so intuitively, as I explained earlier in the answer, uh, the measure theoretic limit is highly non-algebraic. Now, how is this business related to non-comedian geometry? Well, so previously we were talking about these simplicial objects. Uh, as I said, one of the crucial disadvantage is that the SNC model is highly non-unique. So non-comedian geometry from one perspective uh, is precisely to think about all the SNC models uh, at the same time, uh, rather than think singling out a particular SNC model. So this is actually one way to look at what NA geometry means. So from the differential geometric perspective, um, there is also another easy thing to understand, which is very important in this whole business, uh, which is a, a particular dimensional reduction of uh, the Calabial condition. So in general, um, Kähler metrics are locally described in terms of Kähler potential functions. Now, one thing you should have remembered is that the generic region looks like C star to the n. So if you have a function on C star to the n, uh, one thing you can try um, is to impose torus invariance, where I just mean that the kind of the torus are just the the kind of logarithmic fibers of uh, C star to the n. So you demand that this function is pulled back from the base Rn by the logarithm map. So if you do this, um, there are some simple consequences you can observe. So the original function is plurisubharmonic, meaning it defines a Kähler metric uh, if and only if the, the function on the base is actually a convex function. How do you see this? Well, so how, how do you check something is plurisubharmonic? What you do is you compute the I partial partial bar of this function, otherwise known as the complex Hessian. Uh, when you uh, compute the complex Hessian for functions pulled back from the base, what we will get is uh, basically the real Hessian of the function U. This is how you see this. Uh, and this function um, satisfies the complex Monchampe equation, meaning that the determinant, well, basically means the, the holomorphic, sorry, that means the volume form uh, of this metric uh, is equal to the, the volume form des described in terms of the holomorphic volume form uh, given by the product of the d log z i's. Uh, so from a PDE perspective, it amounts to saying that in the logarithmic coordinates, the determinant of the complex Hessian is equal to one uh, up to a constant. Um, so that you can see is equivalent to saying that the function on the base is uh, satisfying the real Monchampe equation, which means the determinant of the real Hessian is equal to one. And as I said, the complex Hessian of phi is basically the same data as the real Hessian of u. So this should come as no surprise. So metric- uh, Young, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're, we're, I just want to let you know, we're about 40 minutes into the talk. We're, we're flexible in terms of when you want to take the break, but I just wanted to let you know uh, in case you want to take the break soonish, it's up to you. So I just want to let you know. Okay, so, so let me finish this sentence and, and then we can break, in fact. Um, so metrics coming from these dimensional reductions uh, is called semi-flat uh, because we are imposing torus symmetry uh, and in particular on any torus fiber, uh, if you have torus symmetry, then this has to be a Euclidean metric. But, the dimension, but this um, does not imply that uh, the metric is a product metric because you can still uh, have metrics varying from fiber to fiber. So the important feature of uh, this dimensional reduction is that if your metric is exactly of this shape, then uh, the fibers of the logarithm maps are precisely special Lagrangians. 
um, which means at least you have some kind of simple test ground for what, uh, what kind of situations you expect to, to find a special Lagrangian vibration on. Uh, so I guess this is the kind of differential geometric background. Okay, I guess we can take the break. So the okay, second part very much for the, uh, okay. going to be slightly more PDE folks. A any questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions actually. So uh, if I understood correctly, you're saying that there is a map from, uh, from a large part of some kind of generic fiber to the essential skeleton, such that the fibers are special Lagrangian. Uh, is that the state o under this uh, hypo uh, non high hypothesis? Uh, that's essentially correct, yes. Okay, then, um, so if you now take this T, uh, this parameter uh, T to the large, uh, large complex structure limit, th are these uh, maps in any way compatible? Meaning, uh, 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 like, sorry, is sorry. It of like say I have a fiber for a given T, then I have a, another T which is closer to the large complex limit. Uh, then, then they live on different manifolds, right? There are different manifolds, but as symplectic manifolds, they're the same. It's just that the complex structure is changing. But, but, but you don't have a canonical way to identify these two. Right? Ah, so that's what I'm asking. Is there, does there exist a way to identify them so that, so that these things are compatible? Is there any kind of... Uh, why, why isn't there a canonical way? There is a polarization on the Yeah, there's like Darboos, well, but there's a point you can just use symplectic parallel transport. Ah. Yeah. But, may, um, but that might not be the way to identify. Yeah, I, I don't so, know. There is a canonical way, I think. Yeah. Well, I suppose one thing you could probably think is every Lagrangian probably specifies a class in the maybe derived category or something. I guess you know this more than I do. Uh, so I suppose. Probably yes, because you, you, you do expect that maybe sta so-called stable classes have unique representatives. Ah, uh, is there? So uh -huh. there, there are some results of this kind. So I suppose it must be possible. Okay, and then finally, just one more question. Like in this literature on S, uh, like people, uh, there's like this expectation that if, I mean, if you have this map, then it maps to a base and there's an integral affine structure. And there's supposed to be like the sing there's supposed to be some kind of singular region which is co-dimension two. Is there any kind of like this small part which there, where, where, where the Lagrangian transformation is not defined? Uh, is that is there any kind of like other than saying that it's like it has small measure? Is there some kind of a uh, way a uh, way of seeing that it somehow maps to some co-dimension two? region and the essential skeleton? Uh, um, so I think the co-dimension two statement is stronger than, uh, I mean, it's, okay, the, the co-dimension two statement is believed to be true in a limiting sense, but- Yeah, I, so I'm asking not, not kind of like, the, is it like, is there a thickening of the co-dimension, like, is, is, it, is there some kind of thickening so that as he goes to uh, zero, I guess, this becomes smaller and smaller? Right, so um, this is believed to be true, uh, but uh, it's, it's currently beyond uh, the, the current results, I would say. Um, I mean, if you're interested, I, I have some previous work about the Calabial threefold case, where I do have some expected description about what happens uh, near the trivalent vertices. So if, if that helps, but, but, but this, um, that, that previous work is more about in the model case, what might happen. So it's not known whether the model case is actually describing the, the actual situation happening for a particular region of the compact manifolds. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Uh, and also this core dimension two statement will have an extra difficulty that, that I can tell you, uh, well, which is related to the regularity theory of real motion pair equations. So I, I, I can tell you the, the rough problem so if you have a local solution of the real Monchampe equation, 
a kind of weak solution. Uh, by, by local solution, I mean uh, on the kind of standard unit ball uh, in RN, let's say, uh, then um, in general, you can only say that the singular set has, uh, let's say, Hausdorff co-dimension, uh, so Hausdorff M minus one dimension zero. Uh, Hausdorff M minus one measure zero. So uh, there exists examples where the co-dimension of the singular set could be m minus one minus epsilon. Uh -huh. So uh, that means unless you have a global reason, by, by local machinery alone, you can't actually conclude uh, the, this co-dimension two statement. Thanks. Very interesting. Uh, that transitions nicely into another qu uh, question from Catherine. Catherine, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the, the great talk. Um, I just had a question at the last slide that you just showed us. Um, is the real Monjean pair equation any easier to solve than the complex one? Uh, well, depending on what you mean by easy. So, uh, well, so, well, so first of all, it, it deals with convex functions and convex functions have better regularity than PSH functions. This is certain, right? Uh, and also the real Monjean pair equation have better understood regularity properties. Uh, so in terms of difficulty, I would say that there's probably one more difficulty to do with the real Monjean pair, which is in this case, you really want to solve it on the essential skeleton. And, and the essential skeleton itself uh, is only a polyhedral set, which means the affine structure is not defined globally. So making sense of the real Monjean pair equation globally is actually quite challenging. Hmm. Uh, but, but the local theory of Monsha, real motion pay is definitely much, much easier than, than a complex motion. Thanks very much. In fact, the, the regularity of the real motion pay is going to appear some, somewhere later. Can I ask a question? Okay. Yeah, so, so you said that uh, this uh, kind of uh, computation with the kind of uh, volume forms and kind of this measure theoretic computation, it's somehow you said that that singles out the essential skeleton uh, inside the dual intersection complex? Yes. I, I don't really understand this. I understand the statement that so the dual intersection complex, I mean, the bulk of the dual intersection complex is anyways defined by the maximal intersections of these divisors. And for each divisor, you have a point, and for each uh, co-dimension one intersection of divisors, you have an edge, right? And the bulk of the, the n-dimensional part, maximal dimensional part of the dual intersection complex is coming from the maximal intersections of the divisors anyways. Am I wrong about this? Right. So, so I guess uh, the, the key thing to understand is, uh, is where this AI equal to zero comes from, right? Uh, so can you see maybe this page? So I, I have this asymptotic formula for what omega t is. So that, that's the fiber-wise Calabria volume form, uh, sorry, holomorphic volume form. So, it, so just imagine doing the actual integration, which I'm sure you can do. Uh, so when, when you do this kind of integration, so when the AIs are equal to zero, you, you will get this kind of logarithmic factors. Mm -hmm. But if the AIs are positive, uh, but by the way, in our kind of, we, we have already normalized the AI to be at least zero. Mm -hmm. So if the AIs are positive, then instead of logarithmic, uh, you will have DZI over Z, Z, ZI, but multiplied by ZI to some positive power. That, that changes the behavior of the integral. Yeah, I mean, I understand this is, this is the, this computation is also kind of used in conservative Zoebelman's papers. It's, yes. It's not a new computation, but what I'm asking is how this computation singles out the essential skeleton inside the dual intersection complex. Because if I'm not understanding it wrong, the essential skeleton, essential skeleton inside the dual intersection complex is not some kind of n-dimensional part of the dual intersection complex, right? It's like it has some flaps, maybe, et cetera. It's not like, you know, there is, 
I, ju I just thought, I, can you explain that part a little bit more? Well, so first of all, uh, those devices corresponding to AI equal to zero, you, you know what these vertices are. Uh, and you just look for those simplices with, with those vertices uh, along this collection. I, I think that, that that's not very difficult. D does that make sense? So, I mean, you, you include a simplex precisely when those vertices appear uh, in the AI equal to zero collection. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, but why, from like, for example, in the K3 case, what you have is some kind of uh, tetrahedron, for example, as the essential skeleton, right? But if you blow up enough, but you have an extra in some kind of particular uh, semi-stable uh, SNC uh, compactification is also some flaps attached to the edges of this. So, so the, the, the point, I guess, is that if you blow up further, you, you, you will not get, uh, well, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are really kind of two kinds of situations. So, so if you blow up somehow in the interior of some device, for example, then, then you will automatically get AI. So there, there are only two things which can occur. One, one is to subdivide the essential skeleton. Uh, the other is to, to have some kind of extra wings uh, mm -hmm. and those extra wings will never lie on the essential skeleton. Yeah, I understand. But how does your argument suggest this? Because that's the only meaning that I can get from the like somehow you, your intuition is supposed to tell me why those flaps don't appear in the essential skeleton, or those wings. But to me, those wings also come from uh, maximal intersections of devices because they're kind of maximal dimensional. Okay, maybe the question is not clear. I guess all I want to say is that you, you would be naturally motivated to define the essential skeleton based on this computation. I guess this is all I want to say. I mean, uh, to, Umad, isn't I, I'm the point? So, if you have, if you do some of these extra blobs, so you get some some divisor that's not uh, shouldn't count as the essential skeleton. It means that the homomorphic form has some extra zeros along that divisor, which would mean that one of the AIs is bigger than zero. But and the, then that that piece wouldn't contribute as much to the volume. I, I think that's the calculation, if I recall. But doesn't that divisor uh, kind of intersect with other divisors, like n other divisors? And at that new intersection point, now I actually can take all the AIs to be zero in some different ZI coordinates. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, the, the whole market form is fixed. Uh, I mean, so you know, you, once you do these extra blow ups, the whole market form is going to have some zeros along the um, along those blown up divisors. Uh huh. And that's going to change those integrals because now there's some positive powers of the ZIs appear. Okay, thank you. We aren't allowed to change the whole morphic form in each neighborhood. That's fixed once and for all. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I think I understand. I think, so it's not, it's not that, so there is, the, the, that divisor could be part of a maximally intersecting collection of divisors, but the holomorphic volume form near those divisors will not uh, have constant, constant part. It will have only, kind of, it will be O of Z, whatever, Z, Z is the yeah, That's right, yeah. And, and as a result, it will okay. not contribute much, as much volume as you would like. Okay, okay. okay. No. It's only the sort of essential bits that contribute the most volume. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, great. This has been a really lively q and I think what we'll do is instead of going into informal mode, since we've sort of used up the entire time, that's terrific. Uh, I think we'll resume the talk now and then uh, at the end when questions, we'll also have an informal mode um, as well. Uh, please go uh, on. I guess go this ahead. is certainly going to overrun the time because uh, we had very lively discussions. So let, let me try to, uh, okay, so instead of talking about everything, let, let me first tell you what the condition from the non uh side I'm actually assuming. This, is, this part is to advertise to the algebraic geometers about what, what they, they need to do or what I hope they could do. Um, 
because some, somehow the main point of the main theorem uh, is that the a priori kind of PDE conjecture is transformed to a question of algebraic plus slash combinatorial slash non comedian nature. So let me tell you what the um, condition actually is uh, for those of you who have some background on this. So consider the solution to the non comedian Calabi conjecture. So this this work by old song, etc. So you should think of uh, so by some kind of analogy of with, with scalar geometry, uh, this you, you have some kind of potential function, uh, but instead of on a scalar manifold or complex manifold, you have some kind of non comedian space. Um, so the conjecture says that the solution to this non comedian version of the Clavi conjecture um, can be described in terms of some kind of finite. Uh, Data, finite dimensional data in, in a sense that, uh, well, so for those of you who know, there is uh, some kind of natural map, which is a kind of retraction map from the non comedian space um, to uh, the dual complex of any semi stable SNC model. So this is um, a kind of a canonical retraction map once you're given this model. So the conjecture is saying that the solution can be described in, entirely in terms of um, some uh, the information living on the finite model rather than on the entire non comedian space. So you should think of the model as uh, the dual complex of any model uh, as a finite approximation to the entire non comedian space. And this conjecture is saying that knowing the information on uh, this finite gadget is enough to describe the solution. So really what you secretly believe is that the dual complex uh, is really, it should be the essential skeleton, but in the conjecture for the sake of kind of, uh, kind of the weakest possible conjecture, uh, what I'm allowing is you can uh, take a larger dual complex, not necessarily exactly the same as the, the, the essential skeleton, but secretly we do believe it should be the essential skeleton. So morally speaking, it's saying that everything is captured at some finite stage. Uh, one of the advantage of uh, this conjecture is a recent result of Christian Bilsmeier, which says that this assumption is enough to imply that the a priori very abstract uh, solution to the non comedian Calabi conjecture under this assumption uh, will actually uh, give you a solution to the real motion pair equation uh, on the open and dimensional faces of the essential skeleton. So in particular, you get this kind of solution to the real motion pair equation, which uh, is much closer to the original PDE question and a much more likely candidate as the metric limit of the, uh, of the sequence of Kanabi R metrics. Okay, so having said uh, what the conjecture is, uh, yeah, that's the advertisement part, I should explain to you uh, some ideas in uh, the proof. Uh, taking off from where we just left off. So I, I already told you this, there's a dimensional reduction called semi-flat metrics. So the first uh, major reduction I want to tell you is that instead of uh, thinking about the conjecture as being about special Lagrangians, um, as long as you only work in the generic region, uh, I claim the essential statement to prove is really only about the metric. In the sense that uh, our real goal is to prove that the Calabi R metrics on those degenerating manifolds um, asymptotically behave like this. Uh, the way you should understand this formula is to say that asymptotically uh, up to maybe doing some kind of rescaling, etc. Uh, the metric is very close in a C infinity sense to a, a semi flat metric. This particular scaling convention we put on here is to ensure that the, the limit has finite diameter. So I claim that this is enough to get the special Lagrangian vibration in a generic region. By the way, this formula is only meant to be very valid in a generic region anyway. Uh, so 
the way you get the special Lagrangian vibration is roughly as follows. So if the matrix is exactly looking like, uh, is exactly semi-flat, then the special Lagrangians would be explicit. They would just be the fibers of the logarithm map. Um, but if you just know that this thing is close to this, but in a C infinity sense, then what you need to do is some small perturbations, is some kind of small perturbation, uh, which is a, a fairly simple thing to do if you are differential geometry. Uh, and more technically speaking, uh, that part would use no more than McLean's deformation theory. So somehow this is really another easy bit of observation. So this reduces the problem of finding special Lagrangian vibrations to a purely metric statement, which is to prove the C infinity metric asymptote. This is reduction number one. Well, reduction number two is to reduce uh, the metric asymptote statement to uh, a statement purely about the potential. So in Kähler geometry, uh, what we like to do is to think of metrics purely in terms of a potential function called the Kähler potential. Well, re really here I'm talking about the local potential instead of the sort of relative scalar potentials. So really what we want to do is to prove that the scalar potentials of the Clavier matrix, if you think about the local potentials, um, they converge in C0 sense, uh, that is to say uh, uniformly, to a solution of the real motion Ampere equation. So the advantage of doing this is that the solutions to real motion pair equations have automatically very good regularity properties. Um, so for, in for instance, one of the good regularity results you, you know is that uh, if you allow yourself to delete a Hausdorff n minus measure zero set, uh, the rest of uh, the solution is actually C infinity. So which means for the purpose of a uh, generic region, uh, you might as well pretend this U is C infinity. So as I said, doing this comes at a, at a cost because uh, final questions like, for example, the singularity had better have co-dimension two uh, would, would basically not circumvent this kind of discussion. So at the moment, we took this kind of shortcut of regularity of the real motion pack, but that will kind of come back if, if you ask even more refined questions. So how do you reduce from, uh, from this kind of C infinity uh, estimate or asymptote to merely a C zero estimate? Well, so here comes in a non-trivial result of Sabin, uh, sometimes known as small perturbation theorem. So which works for a very large class of fully nonlinear second order elliptic PDs, in particular, uh, the complex Morgan equation uh, and it says that if you know some solution is already smooth, which is in our case is the solution to the real motion pair equation. And if you know there's another solution uh, satisfying basically the same equation, but only differing uh, by a small amount from the, the given smooth solution uh, by a small amount in a C0 sense, then what you can do is that the, the very good smoothness property of the first solution would be transferred automatically to the second solution. So you should view this Sabin as a kind of transference of regularity. So if you, if you have some smooth solution and, and you know some kind of C0 approximation, you, you would be able to conclude C infinity approximation. So this is the main non-trivial theorem which reduces the proof to an estimate about the potential. So um, in our case, uh, we apply this Sabin to local universal covers of annuli regions in C star to the N. Um, and that, that is the part which kind of accomplishes the second major reduction, which is to reduce NC infinity asymptote uh, or kind of C infinity deviation estimate to a C zero estimate or at the level of the potential. Now, so the, the real battle is about uh, 
trying to get get hold of the potential. The difficulty, obviously, is that the, the manifolds, the underlying manifolds, are highly degenerate uh, in in this kind of limit. So, in particular, the, the manifolds are highly collapsed, which means lots of standard geometric uh, analysis inequalities would not actually apply. Uh, but there is actually a good thing which applies, which is called pluripotential theory. Uh, so without explaining how the pluripotential works, let me tell you that, uh, okay, so at the moment, the main goal is to prove that, uh, let's say the clavial local potentials converge in C0 sense to some kind of candidate limit, which satisfies the real motion pay equation. So we are, really there are two questions. One is to produce the limit. The second is to argue that this thing actually is the limit in a sense of proving a convergence estimate. Now, the way non comedian geometry comes in is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, under this kind of additional hypothesis of kind of finite uh, stage information captures the full information of the non comedian Calabial solution. Um, what that means is that um, as long as you assume the non-comedian non conjecture, which is still a purely algebraic thing, then you can produce this uh, candidate limit. And, and then somehow the main point is to com uh, compare the candidate limit with the actual uh, clavial potentials on uh, those degenerating manifolds and argue they, they, they are actually kind of close to each other in a C0 sense. Well, how, how do you estimate potentials? Um, so the standard thing to do um, to achieve, uh, well, let's say that there's a general package called fluid potential theory, and its main goal is to estimate potentials. So if you want to achieve upper bounds of a, of a uh, PSH function, uh, the standard thing you do is mean value theorem. If you want to achieve lower bounds, there is a method of colo G, uh, which would give you something of that kind if you have integral bounds on the volume density. Um, so the main point of, um, the main advantage of this colo G package is that in fact, you can rerun this package uh, in a highly degenerate setting and then come up with, uh, well, basically, Basically, you can verify that this package still works um, in this highly degenerate setting. So this is one of the technical main points of, of, of the work. Um, and instead of estimating just one potential, you can uh, another thing you can do is to compare two potentials. So if you know two potentials have um, roughly the same volume densities, you can also conclude that these two potentials uh, are kind of close together in the, the kind of uniform sense. So somehow the main goal of, um, of the potential estimate is to prove that the candidate limit is close to the actual Calabial potential. And what the package allows you to do is to ensure that as long as you have uh, two globally defined potentials, and, and as long as you can verify that their volume densities differ by only a very small amount, then you are able to finish off, uh, provided you check that all the techniques work in the degenerate setting. Um, so I should emphasize that making the two potentials globally defined is actually quite non-trivial. So even if you want, you just want to make the comparison in a generic region, um, you need to work quite hard to, to make sure that uh, the two potentials are globally defined in order for that package to, to work. So Regardless of how we actually produce the potentials, as I hinted, we will actually produce this from non comedian geometry. Um, the really significant features would be essentially two features. One is that the potential should solve the real motion um, pay equation. 
So that would guarantee that it has roughly the, the correct volume density. Uh, the second is a kind of approximation property, which is to say, well, you have uh, some limiting potential, which you believe to live on, for example, the essential skeleton, or in our weaker assumption, you believe that you live on some finite dual complex. Um, but in order to make sense of that solution um, on xt instead of the limit, so realize that xt and uh, the essential skeleton are, are quite different manifolds. So one thing you need to ensure is that um, you need to be able to transfer this candidate limit coming from non-intermediate geometry um, to the actual clavial manifolds near the degeneration. So you need uh, to find some kind of global Kähler potential on the degenerating clavial manifold, which is C0 close to um, this um, non comedian solution on the generic region of XT. Um, and here, one of the crucial thing you need to ensure is that when you graft the solution from this kind of non comedian space to XT, you should be careful to keep track of the Kähler property. Uh, so this is in fact one of the other advantages of uh, non comedian geometry, which is uh, the notion of Kählerness, if you like, or positivity, that's more kind of differential geometry people like to call it, um, is quite nicely encoded into the non comedian machinery. So really, if you're wondering secretly, why, why do we bother with non comedian at all, then I would say there are really kind of two desiderata uh, we want from the non comedian side. One is we want to, pr we want to produce some solution to the, the kind of real Monchampé equation on, uh, let's say, the essential skeleton. And the second is that uh, there should be um, a good way of encoding uh, the Kähler property so that you are able to graft this solution to the actual clavial manifolds on which you want to consider uh, the, the, the potential. Uh, and crucially, you need to preserve this Kähler property. And once you have the two properties, um, you can, in fact, uh, by, by some small extra work, you, you can demand some uh, further property, which is to say, the volume density of, uh, of this kind of grafted solution, if, if you like, is close to being clavial, at least in some L1 sense, which means that it's, it roughly has the correct volume density. So as you can see, the real Monchampé equation is essentially telling you that the density is correct. So, so this is not quite an independent property. It's essentially a consequence of the first two. So the, the point is that from the differential geometric side, the main difficulty with, which has been surmounted uh, in this work is to say, once you get this solution with basically these two properties, um, and you, you speculatively, the non comedian solution ought to do the job, or at least the, the, the non comedian conjecture would, if that conjecture is true, then, then the thing would do the job. Um, so the, the analytic uh, bits uh, has the main upshot that um, once you get this non comedian solution, then you do get this C0 convergence. So, as I emphasized, the main difficulty of this analytic work has to do with the highly degenerate nature of the manifolds, uh, which makes most tools not applying, but still, um, this pluripotential theoretical tool is extremely robust. So uh, let's see. Right, so um, I guess I have overrun quite a bit of time. So um, we could either stop here and, and people can ask me questions or if people want, I can also continue by discussing some uh, kind of general um, impressionistic discussions of uh, non-comedian geometry. What, what, what would you like? 
um, if, if you have some general impressionistic things you could say in a few minutes, we could do that and then still have some time for questions. Uh, uh, it's, up, it's up to you. Okay, so as I said, the non-comedian jump, so I have already discussed you discussed to you why I think uh, non-comedian geometry might be relevant. So, okay, let, let me just give you a, a very broad brush sketch of what this thing is all about. So non-comedian geometry from one perspective uh, comes from the fact that if you just consider one SNC model, uh, you will in quite inevitably get into this kind of non-uniqueness question. So you can always blow up to, to get higher and higher models. So one, uh, one approach to deal with the problem is to consider the essential skeleton. The other approach, which goes like the opposite extreme, is to consider instead all the models simultaneously at once. And basically, uh, you, you have a tower of models, um, and you simply take the inverse limit. And that thing is called the non-comedian space or Bekovich space. So this is what it is. Um, so you should think of the dual complexes of models as giving you finite uh, stage approximations to this highly infinite um, kind of complicated thing. So the comparison goes in two directions. Uh, so first of all, if you have a, a dual complex, there's an embedding map. This thing literally embeds into, into the non-comedian space. And there's also a retraction map going the other way around. And if you first embed and then retract, you get the identity as you might expect. So this retraction map behaves a little bit like logarithm map. So you should think of dual complexes as just giving you finite approximations. And in fact, the conjecture is about kind of pushing this to the level of the solution to the non-comedian Calabial uh, solution. Um, so on this non-comedian space, uh, you can make sense of line bundles and sections. And there's a kind of Gaga principle, uh, which tells you that the notions you get is really the same as the usual algebraic geometric notions um, you get after you try to base change to formal disks. Um, there's also a notion for metrics on line bundles, uh, quite analogous to Hermitian metrics. Um, so for, for instance, in usual Kähler geometry, you might say that two Hermitian metrics on line bundles differ by uh, a Kähler potential. Uh, it's the same with non-Kimedian side. So quite crucially, as I hinted, uh, the non-Kimedian um, machinery captures the notion of uh, Kähler-ness or positivity in, in a very effective fashion. So there, there are several ways to define what uh, positivity means, uh, but I guess the most intuitive one is to say that uh, if you are given a continuous uh, semi-positive metric um, on some non-comedian version of the line bundle, um, so it, it is uh, semi-positive if and only if it arises as a C0 limit uh, of the non-comedian version of Fubini study metrics. So basically, the, in, in Kähler geometry, it's quite well known that um, Kähler metrics can be thought of as uh, limits of Fubini study metrics. Um, so non-comedian version is, is very similar from that perspective. There's also a hybrid topology which allows you to say that um, the complex manifolds converge to this non-comedian space uh, as t goes to zero. So you should think of this as a kind of high level uh, version of um, the previous finite stage hybrid topology I was talking about, uh, where instead of converging to this non-comedian space, you converge to just some kind of dual complex. So for the purpose of SYZ, uh, the fact that you can uh, preserve positivity is, uh, is a quite important feature. There is also a theory of non-comedian motion pay measures. Um, the definition is in terms of intersection theory, not quite differential operators. 
like what you see in complex manifolds. But the pro formal properties are very similar to the usual complex motion pay operator. So for example, um, in the Kähler story, uh, one of the important thing you know is that if a sequence of potentials converge in C0, then the corresponding uh, complex motion pay measures would converge weakly. Uh, it's the same with the non-comedian side. So there are lots of kind of formal similarities. Um, so if the potential actually factorize through some retraction map to the dual complex, which is basically the thing I want to assume in a non-comedian conjecture, then it is known that the non-comedian measure agrees with the real motion pay measure. Um, so more, more precisely, I mean that non-comedian measure would, uh, would live on this non-comedian space and you push forward via the, the retraction map and that defines you some measure on, the, let's say, the, the dual complex, and you can you can uh, check that this is the same as the real motion and pay measure uh, defined by the corresponding function. So the, the upshot of this part is to say that as long as the conjecture holds, then the non-comedian uh, Calabi conjecture, uh, the solution of, of that Calabi conjecture is giving you the desired solution of the real motion pay equation. Um, the non-comedian version of the Calabi conjecture has been proved by Book Song, Fafa, and Johnson. Uh, so you do have some solution, you just don't understand it well enough to. So, so, so the bit I have to assume is a conjecture, but I highly encourage you to, to try to make it a theorem. So to conclude, we have this solution coming from the non-comedian world. Uh, as long as we assume the conjecture, we would get two things. One is the real motion pay solution. Uh, and second, the ability to kind of graft the solution to uh, the actual clavier manifolds near the degeneration uh, within a kind of small C0 error, while at the same time, making sure the Kähler property is not destroyed. And as long as we have this, we have uh, the kind of C0 convergence of the potential to the desired limit. And from that, by Savin's result, we would have C infinity asymptote. And from that, uh, we have the special Lagrangian vibration. Okay, so that's the, the talk. Okay, I obviously overrun quite a bit. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks very much. Uh, are there any questions for Young at this time? Um, on the record first. Maybe I can ask a question. Yeah. So there is a, 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 another weak another version of version. Uh, why do I hear my voice? Is yeah. So there's another weak version of uh, SYZ conjecture, like in the I think in proposed in the paper of uh, Gross Wilson and also Condorcet Soboma, which says that uh, the in the large complex limit, it's just asymptotically a torus vibration doesn't really say that it is a tor torus vibration. Do you have? Well, so I mean, you're, yeah. you make your statement more precise because I feel that this would be exactly the same as I'm talking about. Yeah, my feeling is that it, it is the same. Essentially, the closer you get to the large complex structure limit, the more of the manifold should be covered by these good regions. And then eventually maybe some set of measure zero is, is bad. Oh, this is what a symptotic uh, supposed to mean in that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there was a precise, one of my papers, there was a precise version of a, of a statement. I, I'm not sure if it's implied by, by Yang's statement, but uh, it should be relatively close. I see. I thought it's asymptotic uh, to a torus vibration 
it's like uh, it's like a different manifold, not inside the manifold itself. It's um, like close in the chrome of host of distance. Well, but the 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 conjectures we made on, and Kasevich and Solomon made were that the um, you had Gromov Hausdorff collapse. So if you sort of go to large complex structure limit, you get yeah. Gromov Hausdorff collapse to the um, uh, to to you know, what should be the base of the SYZ vibration. Yes, that's first uh, statement. Right, and you know I think if uh, yeah, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think that this was say at least you have this Gromov Hausdorff collapse on a large piece of the manifold, but then there will be some small region you can't necessarily control. Yeah, so I guess the, the main thing opening at the moment, well, first of all, is this non competing conjecture part, uh, but suppose this part gets resolved, the, the main question would be the kind of asymptote of near, near the singularity and what kind of singularity actually arises. Uh, so I guess one of the main open questions at the moment is that people don't, so the, the non comedian uh, solution at the moment has no known regularity theory beyond C0. So in particular, uh, it's not possible to detect where the singularity actually occurs uh, and what kind of singularity occurs. So we, we do believe that it's co-dimension two um, uh, and maybe in ideal cases, it looks like a, a tree or a, a trivalent graph or something like that uh, if for Clavier three folds, uh, but um, proving something like this seems quite a long distance off. Can I ask another question? So you mentioned this uh, hybrid topology in like maybe two slides ago. Yeah. You, can, you said you can prove that, yes, the, the third bullet point, XT converges to XN as so I, I don't I, mean, I don't understand how what this means at all, but, but can you recover this Gromov Hausdorff collapse at least from this statement? Is it a stronger version of that? Or? Um, so so what what exactly is the statement you want to prove? So so you do do you want to prove so first of all, this is only talking about the generic region, which means that um, okay, so it's not in the state. To, to get the gromov hausdorff limit, uh, some, some of the technical thing you need to do involves also the, the, the non-genetic region. So actually in my paper, there are some kind of discussions on this. You can, you can probably find. Uh, so, but uh, are you trying to ask me what the hybrid topology roughly means? No, but I, yes, that could be a question, but are you saying so this is XT is the, it's not XT. Are you actually wanted to say this uh, generic portion of XT when you said this con convergence? So the statement just says there's some, some kind of topology on X, XT, I think, which is hybrid. And then with that topology, it will converge to XN. What, what kind of topology? So r roughly speaking, the way you should think about this is the, the topology roughly speaking is, uh, so it, it's roughly the topology of thinking about C, C star to the end as a very thin and, uh, and long uh, kind of cylinder-like thing. And uh, it converges to Rn via the logarithm map. So th this is roughly speaking the topology, R roughly. But uh, at least that's the way. I mean, you're talking about something finer than Rn, right? Yeah. You're seeing the entire Berkowitz space, supposedly. So I, I guess if you want to understand what this topology is doing, then, then the better thing to think of is the finite stage approximation. Uh, and in fact, if you assume the, the non comedian conjecture, then, then these two would be equivalent. Um, so, uh, right, so I, I guess in the the finite stage approximation, you would have kind of local pieces of the kind of, uh, well, I mean, so first of all, you, you can write the, the manifold locally as something like C star to the K times maybe some other small factors. And, and then uh, that part would project down to some kind of uh, 
k-dimensional, uh, real k-dimensional uh, kind of simplicial piece, uh, depending on wh which strata you are actually on. Um, but basically, it's it's essentially the same thing as the logarithm map. Well, I have some kind of stupid question. Maybe it's also like it appears that there's a contradiction between the two statements. So as one conjecture says that the general fiber somehow converges in the ground of Hausdorff limit, the base, right? The other conjecture says it converges to Xn, which is some complicated thing because it's the Berkovich space. Oh, uh, I, 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 oh, um, no, so uh, let's say, the, okay, so the believed picture is that the metric limit, uh, so, okay, so there are two statements. So one is not a conjecture, so you, you, you can, you, you can put a topology on Xn, uh, kind of disjoint union, uh, the, the union of all Xt's, mm -hmm. so, so I mean, th th this is done by book song, etc. So I mean, th there exists such a topology. The the other statement is what we believe to be true, which is that uh, the kind of gromov hausdorff limit of the suitably rescaled Calabrian manifolds uh, would actually be the essential skeleton uh, carrying some limiting uh, real Monchampe uh, solution. And that real Monchampe solution is believed to be the same as the non chameleon solution. And they, they would be essentially the same if some version of the conjecture, if, if a stronger version of the conjecture uh, holds. Does this re rescaling is somehow smooth? Like the XN is some kind of, of torus, like some kind of non chameleon torus federation over the essential skeleton. It has the, all these pieces which are infinite trees. So this somehow, there's some kind of rescaling here, which somehow flattens that out. It's just hard, very hard for me to picture. What no, it, it has more to do with the retraction. So, uh, so this XN has a natural retraction map to uh, any dual complex. Um, so uh, the belief statement would be something like the XN would have some kind of retraction map to uh, the essential skeleton, and uh, and uh, the the limit would basically identify the fiber of that retraction map. Uh, so so although X n is a kind of infinite tree of some kind, um, you only so so somehow the the point of the conjecture part of the point of the conjecture is that the, the desired solution is really constant on on those fibers. You see so. So the desired solution is given, you, you should think as given by some kind of potential on, uh, let's say some dual complex, or really you secretly believe it's the essential skeleton. And, and the conjecture is, is saying that the potential is just pulled back from the dual complex, which means it's actually constant on fibers, which also means that uh, if you think about this thing metrically, it means all the fibers are identified as just points. D does that make sense? So I'm still having a lot of trouble picturing this. But, uh, oh, so maybe so, maybe let me suggest that we um, so since we're sort of already into the informal discussion period, maybe let me suggest this would be a great topic for informal discussion with the speaker, um, if that's okay. I I was thinking maybe. Um, in case there's anyone else who want to ask uh, a last sort of official question, maybe just. Um, pause on this line, which is a very interesting discussion. Sort of, I certainly want to hear more details, but um, um, are there any sort of final official questions? Mark, did you have a question? I think you, um, I, I thought maybe you were about to ask something. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm fine. I, I, okay. I, 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 I'm about to go to bed. <laughs> so um, I won't join the, the unofficial discussion. Okay. No problem. Um, Well, I think maybe what we should do, um, so I put a link in the chat. Again, it's the same gather.town link that we used at the previous break. Um, maybe why don't we um, stop the official um, portion of the talk now and continue in gather.town for those of you that can make it. Um, and we'll resume with official talks tomorrow with uh, Mark Gross. So thanks again to our speaker very much. <laughs>